Movement. The second one was how uh, to operate 21st century uh, museums, uh, lecture by Dr. Ruth Kopke of the Hamburg Museum. And this is the third one. We thought of setting up this lecture because of the flurry of the material going back and forth in uh, social network and newspapers. I think they can hear me even without that. Uh, about cultural appropriation. And uh, I'm sure you know that it has uh, leaked, it has inserted in itself, the conversation, into cuisine because Clinton Palanca was decrying uh, some uh, critics uh, uh, calling out a fine dining restaurant for appropriating street food into their menu. And uh, you must have read that. The musical star Sting was stung also because he sang reggae and he was told, you're not Jamaican, you're not supposed to sing uh, reggae. And uh, a young American girl uh, who wore a Chinese dress to her prom was also told by a Chinese blogger, my, my dress is not your prom dress. So all of this has stirred a lot. Uh, we. I'm sure all of us have used uh, designs, have worn a malo, and uh, to go to the extreme, we do gisa our food. So where does appropriation begin and end? When is it proper? When is it ethical? And when not? One of the best experts on that, of course, is uh, with us this afternoon, Dr. Eufrasio Abaya of the University of the Philippines. Of course, I remember to, uh, to call him for this specific project because in 2004, if I remember the year, there was a flurry about the people from Calibo complaining about these people in Metro Manila and the rest of the zone having Ati Atihan festivals when they were not supposed to. And, and so that called uh, to question other performances and interpretations, and he ably facilitated that very uh, from furious and fractious <laughs> uh, concurrence at the AIT of UP. He is, of course, an anthropologist and a professor. And uh, I think if you read your invitations, you'll see his credentials. And I will not spend much time here because I know after his talk, you will have a lot of questions for him. I've not attended to this issue until Cora sort of. Uh, set the stage for this. And so my the title of the presentation is Unsettling Cultural Appropriation. Unsettling in the sense that I come from the position that life is really a negotiation of meaning, fundamentally a negotiation of meanings. And everyday life is a performance of cultural politics for which I mean the contestations over meanings and which meanings, whose meanings, whose ideology, whose position should prevail. And so the, this presentation will pivot around the notion of cultural politics. And so I proceed with some definitions. Um, you, I will read out the definitions. The term cultural appropriation has been defined as code the taking from a culture that is not one's own of intellectual property, cultural expressions or artifacts, history, and ways of knowledge, and profiting at the expense of the people of that culture. This was a resolution of the Writers Union in Canada approved sometime in June 1992. Next, cultural appropriation occurs when a member of one culture takes a cultural practice or theory of a member of another culture as if it were his or her own or as if the right of possession should not be questioned or contested. And that's a Wikipedia definition. Next is from Nasha Apura. Uh, cultural appropriation is taking a symbol or cultural practice out of its original context and then planting it down somewhere else. And it becomes devoid of its original meaning. The people who are doing the extraction often are benefiting, whether through personal gain, financial gain, or entertainment. 
there's always an inherent power imbalance. It is a dominant group taking from a marginalized group. With, with cultural appropriation, it is also often play, it also also plays out in the realities of colonization. It is the colonizer taking from the colonized. We will see some examples of this. So, uh, lastly, we uh, uh, referring to Susan Scadifi, author of Who Owns Culture, Appropriation and Authenticity in American Law. She, she says, or she suggests, taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. This can include unauthorized use of another culture's dance, dress, music, culture, folklore, cuisine, traditional medicine, religious symbols, etc. It's most likely to be harmful when the source community is a minority group that is that has been oppressed or exploited in other ways or when the object of appropriation is particularly sensitive. For example, sacred objects. Let's look at the case of museum exhibit. And very quickly, this is the one exhibit in uh, MFA in Boston. Uh, they canceled that kimono exhibit. Why? Because there, there were protesters and accusing that whole exhibit to be racist in character. Let's play the. Look, but don't touch. It's the brand new policy at an exhibit originally called Kimono Wednesdays that just opened at the MFA. That policy, a total turn from the museum's first idea, sparked after protests. Our Heather Hedges was there as it was open to the public tonight. This is the kimono that started all of the controversy. The MFA won't let me try it on because they've now made the decision not to let anyone try it on, but you can still come up to it and touch it and feel how heavy it must have been for Claude Monet's wife to wear a similar one posing in this painting. In the Claude Monet gallery at the MFA tonight, museum visitors are talking about more than just impressionism. They're talking about ethnic sensitivity and political correctness, debating the merits of the museum's about-face decision today to no longer allow visitors to try on a replica of the kimono in Monet's painting titled Looking East. It's interesting to feel how heavy it is, and it would be kind of neat to try it on and actually feel how heavy it is. But like if I just touch it, okay, I just touch it. It's like the weight is different. The kimono was donated to the museum after the MFA loaned it to several museums in Japan last year. It was actually a Japanese TV station who came up with the idea to recreate the kimono from the painting and allow visitors to try it on. The MFA's deputy director says it was a hit in Japan, so they brought the idea here. The original intent was to have people have a tactile experience of the kimono, to feel it, to understand its weight, its craftsmanship. Every Wednesday night in the summer, the museum offers free admission and lectures about the Looking East painting. But the so-called Kimono Wednesdays drew cries of racism from one group. They started a website called Stand Against Yellow Face. They've been bringing their protests directly to the exhibit. We understand the museum is trying to uh, invite the public to experience history and to get a better understanding of the uh, history behind the painting. However, doing it in this fashion, it is recreating the uh, racism that was part of the time. The MFA says everyone is welcome to participate in their Wednesday night discussions. We were able to stay true to our educational goal. In Boston, I'm Heather Hedges, Fox 25 News. So there you go. Uh, here's an exhibit that uh, became very contentious because uh, a, sect a certain segment of the population <coughs> looks at it as uh, re recuperating or recalling the experience of racism, and which is, again, uh, very much pervasive everywhere. So racism is one racism cultural structure that enables uh, the discourse on cultural appropriation. So it's, it's music. Let's look at music now. Kevin Perry. Although the scene and colorful attire were quite beautiful, 
Carrie is being called a racist for sexualizing a traditional Japanese female figure who is paid to serve as a hostess and excels at the art of entertainment. Carrie had hinted via Twitter about the number, quote, I'll be opening the show and take you on a trip. But as soon as her performance is over, the backlash began. Tweets such as, I guess Katy Perry really didn't want to be left out of the mind-numbingly ignorant and racist pop star hall of shame. And, why are you dressed like a geisha, Katy Perry? Why? For what? Hashtag, this is racist. Like, horribly, obviously racist. But others have come to her defense. Quote, these claims of Katy Perry's AMA performance of being racist are absolutely ridiculous. I am Dan Brooks wrote, appreciation and appropriation of other cultures is okay. Regardless of popular opinion, favorable or unfavorable, Perry reportedly intended to push the brink of artistry and musicality with her opening act at the awards show, which we believe she succeeded. This is Sarah Lynn, and you're watching the new music buzz. The Next is from Bruno Mars. Hello everybody, welcome to the Impressive Channel. There is a huge debate on Twitter about Bruno Mars being a cultural appropriator. This whole discussion was started by The Grapevine, and if you don't know about the show, it's basically a group of young black intellectual individuals who have discussions on certain subjects. And this subject was about Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars is not an original artist in the same way that Michael Jackson was an original artist, in the same way that Prince is an original artist. What Bruno Mars does, is he takes pre-existing work and he just completely, word for word, recreates it, extrapolates it. He does not change it, he does not improve upon it, he does not make it better. He's a karaoke singer, he's a wedding singer, he's the person he's hired to do Michael Jackson and Prince covers, yet Bruno Mars has an album of the year Grammy and Prince never won an album of the year. Wow. So how are you gonna say, wow. so how are you gonna say people that are originators, that are originators in the funk genre, mm -hmm. that are originators in the R&B, the New Jack Swing, Bobby Brown and New Edition don't have no album of the year Grammy, Bruno Mars got that Grammy because white people love him because he's not black, period. The issue Facts. is we want our black culture from non-black bodies. Facts. His music videos, his his dance routine, straight up, I'm stealing this this Bobby Brown fit. Like, I'm not going to change not one step. And he's winning up against artists that are making creative, original work, and I have an issue with that. This clip actually went viral, and a lot of people were talking about it. Now, me personally, I happen to be a big fan of Bruno Mars. I've seen him live in concert, and he's absolutely amazing. He can sing, he can dance, he's just an all-around performer. He plays instruments, he plays the drums, the guitar, the piano, you name it. And he makes feel-good music. Like, you can't deny that his music makes you feel good, and it touches everybody. It doesn't matter what age, everybody can dance and have a good time to Bruno Mars music. With all that being said, is Bruno Mars a culture vulture? No, he's not. And I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why. Because a lot of people don't know the difference between appreciation and appropriation. Appropriators are people who take from a culture for their own benefit without giving credit or respect to the originators of it. Bruno Mars has been very vocal about how black music has inspired him. When he won a Grammy for Album of the Year, he gave props to all of the people who inspired his 24K Magic album. I'm 15 years old and I'm opening up a show in Hawaii called The Magic of Polynesia. Later on in life, I found out that those songs that I was singing were written by either Babyface, Jimmy Jan, Terry Lewis, or Teddy Riley. Bruno Mars has said this in his interview with Latina Magazine. When you say black music, understand that you're talking about rock, jazz, R&B, reggae, funk, doo-wop, hip-hop, and Motown. Black people created it all. Being Puerto Rican, even salsa music stems back to the motherland, Africa. So in my world, black music means everything. It's what gives America its swag. He also said this, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those artists who inspired me. They have brought me so much joy and created the soundtrack to my life filled with memories that I'll never forget. Most importantly, they were superstars that set the bar for me and showed me what it takes to sing a song that can get... So there you go. Uh, it's about appreciation or appropriation. It's about acknowledging your, your, your source, sources of inspiration. 
obviously there is a tension here. Those who are, who argue that please just copycat, and, uh, <clears throat> and mostly those who belong to the so-called black community. And the other, on the other end, is the position that he is not an appropriator, but actually he he, he does acknowledge the inspiration that sort of uh, jumps uh, inspire. I mean the that uh, on which his creativity rests. I put this together to call attention to how those participants would think about their, their, their own practice of appropriating or using certain uh, cultural materials. Note this, for example. Um, this one guy who dressed up like the, the left and this is these are his remarks when asked he said the reasoning behind this look oh it was funny to my friends the religious significance of the garment seemed completely lost on him when asked where the costume came from his apparent ignorance was stunning said he said no idea I couldn't tell you at this moment so the the writer uh, obviously was uh, uh, asserting that these uh, appropriators, if I may call them, the if I may call them, do do not have a sense of why they are. Uh, uh, do do their, their sense of um, taking these cultural materials is rather shallow. So they they they're not very uh, informed. In terms, for example, of the meaning of uh, the religious regalia uh, that uh, they, they uh, appropriated. Details like the ceremonial headdress represent authority can only be worn by certain members of the clergy, and so forth and so on. So it's still disrespectful to wear sacred religious symbols as costume. For the other uh, example is somebody who. Uh, Wore corn cornrows, cornrows, if it's a head uh, hair style, and cornrows do have a history, uh, and this is a hairstyle that originated in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, in the modern day society, uh, during the time of slavery, it's believed that African slaves used cornrows as a way to convey they wanted to escape, to escape. In modern day society, cornrows are often stigmatized and criminalized when worn by black people. And yet, did you see? It, these cornrows are, are worn by white people, and it's acceptable. Again, here, uh, the, the idea of racism comes into play. <coughs> Let's look at uh, another case of uh, the wearing of the kimono. This is Carly Claus. She's a model and her job is to pout at a camera and jiggle her boobs. This is her value. This is how she makes her money. She's not paid for her intelligence or her morality. Despite all of this, she's been accused of the awful crime of cultural appropriation. What, you may ask? As a society, it isn't hard to see that the West is circling the drain. The utter nihilism, mixed with a touch of self-loathing, lathered in hedonism, and a healthy pinch of narcissism, has created a society where utterly ludicrous concepts are being machine-gun vomited by the regressive left and become as numerous as the stars in the sky and as psychologically odious as contracting brain syphilis. While the list of utter tripe that has been regurgitated as truth across the halls of academia and in the controlled media is seemingly without end, recently this spewing of stupidity has washed up the sludge of a concept that's been termed cultural appropriation. Susan Scafidi, a law professor at Fordham University in her book, Who Owns Culture, admitted 
that, as usual, with what triggers the left, it's difficult to give a concise explanation of cultural appropriation. But she says it's taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. This can include unauthorized use of another culture's dance, dress, music, language, folklore, cuisine, traditional medicine, religious symbols, etc. Uh-huh. Well, let me translate this plethora of gobbledygook for you. Cultural appropriation is a very toxic concept with definitions so ambiguous and so different depending on the person they are coming from and, more importantly, on the single group of people that is always targeted for derision. And let's be honest, we all know which group that is. And there should be no borrowing of anything from other cultures by Westerners because of their privilege of, well, let's be honest again, single-handedly creating the modern world. Clearly, this concept does nothing but support segregation. In fact, it promotes racism within Western societies that are being forced to diversify against the overwhelming wishes of the voting public. It's from this position that even though the mantra that diversity is our strength, only the most evil desire to live in a homogenous society. And this evil must be forbidden to Westerners via mass, uncontrolled, and unrelenting immigration. But even then, Westerners are forbidden from mixing culturally with the new arrivals flooding into their countries, lest they may culturally appropriate. It's oxymoronic. Or to put it simply, Africa and African cultures for the Africans, Asian and Asian cultures for the Asians, and Western countries and Western culture for everyone. And this brings us to the March 2017 issue of Vogue magazine, ironically meant to celebrate, and is called its diversity issue. It had seven different women that were supposed to represent American womanhood. Obviously nothing close to the actual demographics of the country, mind you, but even then it was slammed by outlets everywhere, including Cosmopolitan, as not being diverse or, one of my favorite words, inclusive enough. You literally cannot win with these people. But that said, the cacophony of hatred and vilification was especially reserved for Carly Kloss and her unforgivable crime of, get ready, yellow face. This woman, who's paid to show her breasts on command, was part of a fashion spread for which she donned several geisha-inspired outfits. And with self-righteous rage, there were pundits and Twitter users alike across the Western world that were horrified and offended on behalf of the Japanese. Because she was singled out for derision for what they called her blatant cultural insensitivity, this mannequin of a woman was forced to apologize and show forced contrition. And while smug white people enjoy feeling insulted and humiliated on behalf of others, all I would like you to do is look at this. This is Shibuya in Tokyo on, well, Halloween night. Halloween has only been celebrated here for less than 10 years, and the street festival in Shibuya is most likely one of the largest in the world. However, no one has told this gaggle of French nurses, sexy police women, and the multitudes of where's Waldos of their horrific and unforgivable crime of cultural appropriation. <laughs> Interestingly, when Japanese people were shown the photo shoot, they were bewildered by the attitudes of these professional victims who feigned indignation on their behalf. BuzzFeed Japan, yep, are you surprised? It tried to pawn this rubbish of outrage with regards to the photo shoot in a very lengthy piece in Japanese, trying to explain why the crime of cultural appropriation was just another example of the evil of Western people, and also asked their Japanese readership what they thought of the photos of Carly. This was a bad move, BuzzFeed, as the answers are indicative of the fact that the Japanese have not been infected with the same mental diseases that many in the West seem afflicted with. Of the close to 11,000 answers, only 9% responded negatively, with 33% being neutral and a whopping 58% having no problem whatsoever with the photo shoot. As well as the 91% of Japanese people who were not bothered by a Western woman taking some photos in Japanese-inspired clothing, the comments left on the Japanese BuzzFeed article were overwhelmingly positive. 
Many of them are in English and you can read them yourself. For example, Junko says, I am Japanese, but I did not mind at all. No problems. The photos were taken so beautifully and creatively. Thank you for introducing Japanese cultural beauty. Or Ryu, where she says approximately, check out the vote above. Almost all Japanese take a positive view of Carly as a Japanese cultural model. Maybe where the disconnect I think that's adequate. Uh, that uh, video tells us, I mean, very obvious that the speaker is uh, for the idea of more freedom in terms of uh, using or appropriating certain symbols, which uh, he was able to bolster when he attended to the you know responses of Japanese themselves, who in his view have endorsed, had endorsed the whole idea. Because in Japan itself, as the speaker said, uh, there's a great deal of appropriation taking place there. Now, uh, let us look at... Uh, How do you pronounce this, Lobotan? Yes, Lobotan. Lobotan. Okay. Lobotan. Okay. appropriate So there... Um, yeah. Ano din ito, no? Lumabas sa feed, sa social media, asking the question, is this a case of cultural appropriation? Yes. So, yeah, no? Fabrics. Yung fabrics nito, I think may ito ka, no? Up north, up there. Tiboli, Tiboli, Tiboli. Binakol. But the center one is Tiboli. Meron din halak ito? Well, no, 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 the, 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 the blouse, the blouse. Uh -huh. The, the rose, the diamond. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ah? Yeah. Which, yeah. which part? The, 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 the front part. Ah, okay. Maybe yeah, that's one, that's one. Not the cap, it's yeah. their uh, embroidery. It's ah, the yeah. uh, yeah. blouse, the yeah. blouse, the blouse, the blouse, the blouse. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 So is he uh ano dia no high high separate the linea um depends on the express and text style. Now let me read to you um let me read to you a reaction of uh, an anthropologist to this, no? Honestly at this point I don't think I can call this use of Philippine te textiles by Christian Lubutan as a tantamount to cultural appropriation. I question the label Manila Kaba, the term Manila inspired, because clearly most, if not all, of the textiles were woven and made by weavers in cultural communities outside of Manila. Yeah, so, yung. Misleading. And then the GI geographic location, GL, no importante daw yan sa GL. That's a, a, a language in, uh, in, sa inyo na, sa, sa legal term also, in geographic location. So the cultural mapping ito eh, no? So, okay. And then she, she noted that with regard to the binacol used in the bags, I think there were the, those were done in Sarat Ilocos Norte, but then there is the recognition that these are Philippine textiles. And that's good enough, so in her view. And as the article, I think, shows, Mr. Lobotan worked with the great women of ASEAN platform in this project. Great, ASEAN, great women in ASEAN platform. Meaning, he procured the textiles with permission through a group that even supports crafts women and women entrepreneurs. It will be a totally different matter, of course, if Mr. Lubiton copies the patterns, if he has this with woven and outside the community where they originate, and or if he says that these were done somewhere else. Okay? Should every piece of textile used in the uh, CL products identified according to the ethnic group from where they came, or the ethnic groups recognize at all marketing levels so that uh, end, use, end consumers who know who produce the textiles. I guess these are matters that Filipinos in the Great Women platform could have discussed with Mr. Lubutong. 
if any of the textiles used in the CL products are sacred to certain groups, which means that those should only be used exclusively, that exclusively by those groups, or by certain members of these groups, or exclusively for certain rituals, then it would definitely be a case of cultural appropriation. But as of now, I don't have the impression, that impression uh, that any of those te te textiles are sacred. The textiles are woven and sold for livelihood. So, the bigger goal is to have better exposure for their textiles, as I began, with the view that they get whole companies as clients. I don't see any vegan dinner put in the pictures of the bags, but I'm sure that our weavers would be so proud if their own products could, have, could be made into uh, other beautiful items. And then, uh, the discourse went on to suggesting that baka nagkamal naman ang pera itong si Mr. Lebatar. Sa thinking naman ng anthropologist, basta pinayaan sila ng tama, kahit nagtubo pa siya ng sangkaterpa, okay na. That's, that's her view. Sabi niya, for how much did Mr. Lebatar or Great Women Platform purchase those textiles from weavers. Well, my guess is he paid for those at the price deemed fair for the Great Women Platform. Should a French designer be faulted for making beautiful bags out of the weaver's styles and selling them at super high, super high end prices? We've sold our textiles at the price we were quite happy about, and we did not say anything like exclusively for Filipinos only. It's the same thing when we encourage people to buy our Abel Elo Eloco and use them to make other products. We don't, we don't say for Ilocanos or Filipinos only, etc., etc. If uh, Mr. Lebaton makes a lot of money from the venture, then I'm with you, Manang Raquel, sabi niya, in lobbying for a fund that would serve the weaving communities. So at the back of their minds, there's kind of a more surveying implicit suggestion that there's a moral responsibility also for this designer to to look after the, the weavers in terms of uh, supporting them the, the weaving uh, uh, the weaving communities so that we can have the most economic benefits benefits from our crafts for from for their crafts so yung iba naman, feeling nila talagang nakaka-high blood yung, yung nangyari daw. Kasi, how about setting aside a percentage of profits from sales of these very expensive bags to go into fund, to, to a fund that will assist the needs of traditional and indigenous weavers in the Philippines. So may mga ganong uh, thinking yung mga tao. No? Uh, when you appropriate and you um, uh, benefit a great deal, then you have a moral responsibility to to reciprocate. That's one position. Now let's move to Nike. Ito yung paborito ko, paborito ko naman siya. Nangyari. I mean, in terms of design process, uh, this guy is half Filipino graphic designer, Eric Toto. I don't know if he has a lot of And uh, he's, he works for Nike. So, it, I, and I've learned a lot from this also in terms of the whole process of design. So there's something, yeah, something indigenous, something unique, something with pride, something with energy, something Filipino. How did he translate these ideas into the design of the Nike shoes? I mean, something unique, he appropriated, or he took inspiration from the chimney. An application, you can see it there. Can you see it? I'm going to turn it on. Press the, the one on top. The one with the line. Yeah. Oh, it is application, and then it is design. 
data inspired by the gene. Next is something indigenous. The, and yung kanya nga, no, inspiration is from the Bani. Okay. Building Filipino design patterns. And then something with pride. So inspiration niya, parang kay basketball. Yung kanya painted uh, court. So yung may mga translation nito in terms of design, the application of the of the painted court. And then something with energy yung inspiration naman niya chinelas. No shoes, no problem. So ito yung application niya. Pinasok niya yung design ng chinelas doon sa loob na. And so on. And there you go. Can we call it, can we call this cultural appropriation? Parang it's a, a, a creative process. Let's go back to the definitions. No, I think I don't think this will pass for the that part of the definition that there is desecration. Well, I don't know, sacred idea here. No, no violation at all. Uh, I think there is truthfulness uh, in terms of the, the provenance of the, the design. He didn't mention phony. And in fact, I find this really quite very, very ingenious, no? Exactly, yeah. so great. And, uh, and so there. Now let's move to one more. Anong nangyari dito? This thing came in the Vaira, no? Did you contribute to the whole exchange, Maria? <laughs> the one more. I could not because I'm the new chair of the Vaira. And I oh. could not because I was the old chair of the Vaira, so. So you inhibited? Yes, we were doing so um, now I would read to you. I I forgot to I know, to print out. Ikin Salvador, yeah. the anthropologist who did study, yeah. uh, that really benefited a great deal from from one boy's uh, life as a tattoo artist. Um, her position is that as long as she approved of the idea, one yeah, one boy, mm -hmm. no problem. But with a caveat that, sabi niya, uh, was she treated like a, a specimen during the whole event? So she had the sense, she, she, in very subtle ways, took issue with the fact that they were like exhibited in a platform, and they're doing the tattooing, and they're like objects of curiosity. And she was there the whole day doing the tattooing, and so that she was caught sleeping also, you know, taking a, a nap. And all of this triggered these exchanges in the, you know, social media, think, saying that she was exploited. That's, now, it's, it's, it's later on we can make a, uh, a judgment. No, but in other words, what is important when we talk about uh, cultural appropriation, we, we don't forget the idea of making a judgment. And that judgment is <coughs> Uh, fundamentally political uh, because it involves relationships of power. Um, my own view though is that what the exchanges in the discourse seem to have ignored is the fact that all of this took place in the context of market, the market, which sort of defined how, for example, she was recruited from the mountains and, uh, and uh, they, they did a great deal of, they invested in that whole event. Why? Because she is a, she's a, what? 
Very marketable. Craftsman, artist. Artist, but quite uh, a novelty. Uh, and also, I, I read in the in the material that they brought her in because they were uh, advocating for her nomination for or nomination to the uh, Gamaba. She was nominated. Yeah, she was. And we, we you were part of the panel. Yeah, we, we deliberated. Uh -huh. And uh, but there are rules. Rules are rules and, and criteria. I mean, there are certain criteria that uh, we're not, uh, what do you call this? Met. Met. And particularly that she did not really pass on that whole tradition. Uh, because the, the context has changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are no longer warriors and so on and so forth and so on. And, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to uh, elaborate on this. <laughs> yeah, recall that uh, conference, and uh, this is this was the report given to NCCA. Uh, sadly, though, uh, not much of a dent has been made because there was really no clear connection established between that whole process of knowledge production and policy making that is quite missing. So this is, this report is sitting in their library. Yes. So wala pang talagang concrete steps uh, drawn from this. Uh, that's, that's whole discourse. We can recall some of this now. I'm talking recall that I made mention of this more serious treatment of the whole issue of cultural appropriation. I'd like to think that um, academia has its own body of knowledge and are born out of popular culture in the sense that here there's greater freedom, that the language is not very restricted, and uh, did you listen to that one guy earlier? Uh, very rough language that he was using. But when you talk about academia, there's this sanitized, rather sanitized language. And um, I've been socializing to using this language. So this book, I think, is a very useful book because it brings together very uh, notable scholars. For example, Anthony Seeker is in, in this ecology, and, and there's an article on ethnic ecology and law. And that whole part, yeah, the appropriation of music and musical forms, appropriation of art and narrative, uh, this is an interesting title, Stop Stealing Native Stories. There's all these fiction writers. Um, continuing on to you know, disappearing debate, racism, blah, 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 and then appropriation in colonial and post-colonial discourse. Uh, appropriation in popular culture. Appropriation in tangible cultural property. Um, okay. I, I found the selected bibliography also very useful, or you might want to procure some of the materials later. This is the one I was telling you earlier, uh, and this is incorporated in the book and uh, suggested. For example, uh, well, it's titled Structural Representation of Cultural Transmission. Is it appropriation or assimilation? And these are the institutions or structures, if you will. No? Industrial, ideological, economic, political, institutional, and military. So all of this, of course, uh, they, they uh, do hold intrinsic power. Uh, so, yeah. Letter C is about cultural assimilation. Letter D is about cultural appropriation. And what happens there? It did not. In the three. So there's, of course, others would say this is very binary, no man, no, no, 
nonetheless, it's still quite useful. There's the agents of culture, and then there's agents of culture in the cultural appropriation here. And those agents of culture in cultural assimilation are distinguished from those agents of culture and cultural appropriation because there is a super superordinate subordinate relationship that, that's uh, characterized in, in terms of how culture here no, is produced and it's produced in these sites of contestation and mediation myth, narrative, literature, popular culture, advertising, education, religion, art, music, scientific knowledge, law, fashion, film, mass media, these four symbols down the line. But here, in cultural transmission, there is attention given to hybridization and transculturation. But what that means simply is that there is all this mixing. Huh? And uh, in cultural assimilation, one can anticipate uh, forms of resistance and counter hegemony because if we uh, look at the counterpart, the cultural appropriation, what what is uh, palpable is authority and hegemony when you talk about cultural appropriation. And then there's the colonizer-colonized relationship. And in, in, in all of this, these transmission processes, state cultural policy and coercion and legitimation is, is also implicated. And later we'll find out that uh, the response to this will have to implicate the role of NCCA, which is a state instrumentality, which is why I agree with Marianne uh, to frame this. This framework is partly informed by political economy. So the political economic frame cannot be ignored when we speak of cultural appropriation. And down the line, no? So there, in fact, here, oh, may mga emergent cultures, like there are social movements, and I, I, I would imagine in the U.S., because of the civil rights movements, no? All of that, that movement really has spawned a great deal of uh, consciousness, which is critical of the ways in which inequality is uh, pervaded in the U.S. and elsewhere. Here are some further illustrations which I gathered from the book. The taking of sculpted marbles, friezes from the Parthenon in Athens by Lord Ingle, uh, Elgin, and their removal to England where they were eventually sold to the British Museum. After repeated requests and considerable diplomatic strain between Greece and the UK, the British still refused to return. You're familiar with this. The recording by an American folk singer and of an ancient Senegalese folk song, the composer of which is not known. And then another example is the taking of an Amazonian Indian arrow poison used in hunting by a pharmaceutical industry company from which the, the muscle relaxant D tuberculin is patented and marketed. The publication of stories by a white writer belonging to a Canadian West Coast native band, which can customarily only be told by certain elders. The painting of a non-Aboriginal artist of words based on images taken from native cultures in North America, including patterns and symbols found on carpets, earthenware, uh, blankets and clothing, and native peoples dressed in traditional clothing. The adoption of the Tahoha peoples in Mexico, the discourses of colonial Spain, assimilating cultural practices of cultural origin. So, makikita niyo dito yung counter appropriation naman. The publication by Kinsella of stories set on the Omiba Indian Reserve in, reserve in Alberta, Canada, where some of the fictional characters are given names of real people living in the reserve. Imagine that. The adoption of audiences in America and around the world of musical forms derived from the artistic expressions of former slaves brought to America from Africa, including jazz, blues, soul, rap, and other forms. 
those that book represents in terms of what values it's asserting. The value of cultural degradation. The, this whole issue of cultural degradation is, is important because appropriators steal their cultural soul. They misrepresent them. They silence their voices. They purport to speak for them because of these important cultural goods may be weakened and destroyed. So that's cultural degradation, the notion of cultural degradation, the notion of aesthetics and stewardship. Cultural treasures are sometimes diluted, altered, ruined, commodified. Sacred practices are trivialized and their sacredness ignored or profaned. The next one is material deprivation. Appropriators abscond with the, the profits of someone else's intellectual property. They free ride on the property of others without proper compensation or recognition. Lastly, claims of sovereignty. We conceive of these cultural goods as ours and so have the right to control their use. Through appropriation, these sovereign claims are ignored. I identified uh, a very uh, uh, what, uh, vibrant cultural response, at least, in NCTA. This is the cultural mapping bit. I think Cora, for a while, you were involved here for not, not intangible, right? And Dr. Peralta, Was also involved. Well, I don't, I don't really it is not only a method of, for cataloging the cultural assets of a community, it is also a tool useful for community engagement and collaboration. It is understood to be the process of identifying or stating in a written or visual inventor, inventory all cultural assets within a specific geographic area. This includes gathering and time and intangible assets from the community, including but not limited to cultural organizations, artists, and stories. So we end up um, If I may add, no, um, we can also learn from the experience of Malaysia and Indonesia, also the experience of Australia and New Zealand. There's a great deal of literature of how they've been able to protect their intellectual property and how they have won for certain cases talaga, no, of, of certain artists suing uh, uh, companies for having appropriated their designs. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, I forgot the name, but uh, I do have. If, if anything, I must confess to you that this talk really pushed me to do, to do some more research because my only exposure to this was that 2004 conference. And of course, our staple in anthropology, which I mentioned earlier, the whole notion of cultural politics, which, uh, which I developed in my dissertation, and in the context of this is control in the Philippines, and how cultural politics also played out in the whole arena of uh, this is control. Now, um, if I may have to summarize all of this, I, I, would, I would suggest that among other constructs, I think it's time for us to attend to the notion of the local moral world. That to me is central because in everyday life a lot of things are at stake and because um, you stand to lose, you stand to gain for certain, making certain decisions then we can see this whole practice of cultural appropriation in that light. Why people appropriate culture is hinged on the, what? Their posterior and ulterior motives. <laughs> if I may make that joke. But um, really, uh, I underscore again here that to understand that whole notion, you frame it in social relational terms. And definitely would lead us to think few guys about the work of power and the institutional support or the institutions that sustain the work of power. And so we're talking here not just at the individual level, but I 
think we have to think in terms of collectivities. We have to think in terms of history as well. History of uh, that, that, the life of that collectivity. The whole problem, I think, also lies in the fact that um, we, our culture, the, the notion of culture, is also perpetuating a lot of these problems because there is that notion of culture that's static, which uh, and essentialized, and people think it is it is something that uh, will have to be preserved. And I think also that that's part of the problem uh, that that certain interest groups. Because you benefit if you want to preserve culture for your own purpose. But we know that in practice, making meanings is, is part of the everyday. And so if you look at culture as that, the meaning-making process, then it is imaginable that cultural appropriation is the, always the order of the day. We always appropriate okay which is why I think we have to think about the practice of appropriation in light of the local moral world which defines in, in certain very contextual understanding of what is right or wrong and so we have to start thinking through uh, think, thinking about this universe universalizing discourse of ethics because we have to situate it within certain contexts. And that is the virtue of the notion of morality because it is sensitive to the, the sense of the ethnographic, the, the, the context, right? It's, it's, it's so we have to understand all those infamy uh, cases earlier in terms of how racism operates in that context in the US, right? And so, there's all these contestations over uh, what what it means to be black, or contestations of, over what to be called in black history. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this exhibit that about the scaffolding, yung iba ibang media. That was yeah. also something yeah. um, explosive, yeah. right? And the uh, American, the Indians, I think they they raise hell. So so it was burned, it was demo uh, demolished as part of, it was supposed to be uh, public art, right? And so I hope, um, I'll end my, my talk at this point, maybe we can now converse because that was my intention, really. I came here thinking that I might be able to steer further discussion on the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you.